How did a spinster from a century ago, who infamously declared, I don't care for children, and called them little wretches, launch an organization that not only saved millions of them from starvation after the Great War, but changed the way the world treats young people to this very day. We'll meet this amazing, influential woman next. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old towns of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, wet side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Now number one in podcasting, thanks to loyal listeners like you. In this episode, we welcome a familiar face back into the time machine. Claire Mully returns to chat about The Woman Who Saved the Children, a biography of Eglantine Jeb, founder of Save the Children. Beginning in 1919, Save the Children has fought to uphold the human rights of children worldwide. Although modern listeners are familiar with the charity because it's promoted by big-name stars and enjoys widespread recognition, its origins are much more humble they trace back to a forgotten founder, Eglantine Jeb. Her life was short, but she made the most of every minute. That's why her legacy endures to this day. Everywhere Save the Children protects the most vulnerable members of the great human family. Author and historian Claire Mully joined Save the Children as a corporate fundraiser in the 1990s. She's the mother of three daughters as well as a writer, and she published this acclaimed biography to mark Save the Children's 90th anniversary. So she joined us to discuss it now that the charity Centennial has come around. By purchasing a copy of The Woman Who Saved the Children, you're making a contribution to the charity and helping to support its good works in almost every nation around the globe. We last caught up with Claire to discuss her book, The Women Who Flew for Hitler, a true story of soaring ambition and searing rivalry. Find that interview in our archives at historyauthor.com, our iHeartRadio channel, iTunes, or wherever you're listening now. For more on our guest, visit clairemully.com, follow at Claire Mully on Twitter, or toss her a like to facebook.com slash Author. Her name is spelled C-L-A-R-E-M-U-L-L-E-Y. Okay, now that we've learned a little bit about this enigmatic angel of mercy, let's join Claire Mully and meet the woman who saved the children. I'm joined on the line from the United Kingdom by Claire Mully, author of The Woman Who Saved the Children. A biography of Eglantine Jeb, founder of Save the Children. Welcome back to the History Author Show, Claire. Thank you. It's great to be back. You have this line from Eglantine Jeb, I don't care for children. (laughs) And when I saw that, I said, what a gift for you as a biographer, because here you're telling the story that's of this woman who has saved so many children, even even decades and decades after her death. Yeah. And you have this great counterintuitive quote, and we're picturing somebody, I'm sure, when we think of Save the Children, who's sitting there in a sea of children reading books to them in some really burned out place after the Great War. Yep. That was not her. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. And, it, and that makes her riveting because she's just oh, like yeah. us. We have contradictions, all of us. But this is a huge one because this is, this is her legacy. It's one of the things I just love about her, you know, that she is the founder of the International Development Agency, Save the Children, saved the lives of many millions of children, improved the life chances of many millions more. And yet she wasn't very fond of individual children. She did say, you know, I don't care for children. Um 
individually. Um, she she didn't particularly get on with them, though. I mean, for a while, she was a school teacher before she found her vocation in life. And, and she, she meant to do well by all people. It's just that as a school teacher, she found children were really noisy and loud and tiring. And she soon found out she wasn't cut out for teaching. And she actually said, you know, the dreadful idea of closer acquaintance of, with children will never enter my mind. So she was, you know, quite upfront about this. But I don't think you have to be about children or maternal or very fond of individual children to want to do what she wanted to do. I mean, she <laughs> set up Save the Children at the end of the First World War at a time when in Germany alone, 800 children were dying every week. This is after the end of the war. And she, she commissioned some early research into child development. And she knew that whereas adults may be able to make up the lost ground after a period of famine or starvation, children may be permanently set back both Physiologically, um, they have a thing called arrested development where their bodies do not develop as they should according to their years and also psychologically as well. So children really do need to be among the first to receive aid. And Egentine also subscribed to this idea. I said that a bit flippantly. It's not an idea. It's the truth that children are the future. They are the next generation. So at a period, especially after the end of such a terrible conflict, many people wanted to ensure that the future would be peaceful, that there'd be better international relations between nations. And children were the key to that. So Egentine wasn't the sort of woman who would have patience for children sitting on her lap. Um, but she did want to help children as young people, as children, but also children for all of us for the future. And she was driven by this very strong humanitarian impulse, which sounds obvious, really. But at that time, wanting to help the children in, in Britain, she always wanted to help children in her own country, but also overseas, including in former enemy countries such as Austria and Germany, was seen as seditious. And she was sent death threats, hate mail, you know, the original trolls. We had them then as well, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but, you know, she said, I have no enemies under the age of seven. So she she was driven by this very <laughs> progressive and pioneering position, really. I like that you have this character that very easy to read her story and to meet her because you don't read it and think, oh, gosh, I, I have to put this down. I can't get this woman. She confuses me. But it does make us think. And, and that's so key to her overall mission here because yeah. it's very easy to look at those pictures and just ignore the suffering of children. Yeah. And she's somebody that recognizes it. And you don't have to, as you said, you don't have to be just and crazy that, for them or for anything. It doesn't mean, I mean, there's people who like dogs and cats and that maybe don't don't want to have children, but it doesn't mean they wish to see them die these miserable deaths. <laughs> no, I mean, what's wonderful about Eggentine is she's a really sort of fully rounded, normal person. She's got plenty of faults, but she's also fantastic and we can really relate to her. You know, she doesn't hate children, but she, she doesn't want to spend much time with individual children. She's She's just very passionate. She's very dynamic. She is quite problematic in some ways. And uh, she's, there's so much to love about something her. Something about the gray there. You, you mentioned the trolls that we deal with today. It's something that people even then struggle with as far as Eglantine Jeb's mission that you tell in The Woman Who Saved the Children, where you you must certainly be for the Hun if you're going to be for saving his children, you know, if you're going to be for saving the German children. And that's not at, at all what it was about. It was about if you're a four or five-year-old child, the sins of the father shouldn't be visited on you. So this is something that I just love because... I like to go in that narrow space. It's one reason why I avoid the idea of who's your favorite president or who's your favorite singer or whatever it happens to be, because there may be different times. There may be things that we relate to her about, and there may be things we think are strange. If we met her as a child, Eglantine Jeb, we'd probably think, well, that, that lady seems kind of standoffish. I'm sure we wouldn't put it that way, but you, you wouldn't be going running over to her because you wouldn't be getting that signal. And yet she may have saved your life. Yeah, exactly. I mean, she wouldn't if when you came across her, she didn't necessarily come across as a do gooder. She's not saintly in that way, and I like her all the more for that. And yet she achieved so much more than many people that sort of set themselves up as something grand. She just went out and got on with it and achieved so much. So yeah. I wanted to mention one thing, a personal story when you talk about the development of children. My mother is now past 80. Hopefully she's not listening because she wouldn't like me to tell her age. But <laughs> she lived through the Blitz in London in your neighborhood. And even then, being a, a little girl, she suffered trouble with her teeth for many years. She always said that they didn't develop properly. And they weren't starving like they were in mm. Germany after the Great War. They had, they'd won the war. We're in the process of fighting it. But you were dealing with powdered milk. You weren't yeah, getting your full you – were, your food was literally rationed. So here's this little girl. And – 
she she doesn't grow to her full potential and then it ends up having an impact later and here i am telling that story and i'm sure that influenced me and and the way that i was fed and so the, this is something where it's not just you missed a few meals if you go to the save the children website you see some of those videos and the pictures yeah. it's it's something that has to cripple you for the rest of your life and really set you back and wherever you were it, it, this woman is going to try to help you. And today, her mission is spread to almost every corner of the globe. That's right. It's all over the world. She and her sister, by the way, Dorothy Buxton, they lived in a world where children were meant to be seen, not heard. They were viewed very differently than we view them today, in part because of her work. She resolves, they together resolve to protect their rights. And that was a notion that was very foreign at the time, people wouldn't have thought that your children was your children. You would do what you wanted. You would. They had all these sayings today that we recoil at, I guess, like spare the rod, spoil the child. She changes over the course of The Woman Who Saved the Children, your book, how humanity itself treats the next generation, at least those of us in the Western world. But also they're going out into the world and they're impressing upon people elsewhere in the world who may never even be able to find Britain on a map and much less know who Eglantine Jeb is, that they need to change the way that they think, that children are not just there so that you have eight or ten of them to work in the fields. Mm -hmm. What about their story hooked you into working for Save the Children and then writing this book now ten years ago and we're marking the centennial now in 2019? That's right, 100 years. Yeah, well, actually, I hadn't heard of Eglantine or her sister, Dorothy, until I worked at Save the Children Fund, but, which I think is extraordinary given how much Eglantine achieved. I mean, she, she not only set up the world's leading independent international development agency focusing on children, she also, on her own, came up with this revolutionary concept that children, basically, that children were human beings and therefore they should be party to human rights. Because before Eglantine, children weren't recognised internationally as having rights. You, they were either wards of state, if they were the orphans, or they were almost the property of their parents. Human rights started at 18. So Eglantine came up with this really revolutionary concept, and it's changed the lives of children all over this world. And so I thought it was amazing that I hadn't heard of her until I joined the organisation. You know, just last year in Britain, we had a new £2 coin and a new £20 note, and uh, the British Treasury decided to put a woman on them. I thought, fantastic. And they put on one of my favourite authors, Jane Austen. But they put her on both the note and the coin. It was as if the British Treasury couldn't think of another woman worthy of the honour. <laughs> and yet we have this extraordinary woman, Eglantine Jeb, and so many other women that have achieved so much. So, you know, I wanted to write a book about Eglantine, uh, not just because she was worthy and achieved so much, although that is true. I mean, that was one of the base reasons that inspired me, but also just because she was so fantastic. She was irreverent. She was very courageous, ahead of her times, breaking convention, you know, never one for boundaries except when she was overstepping them. She was very witty. She loved riding horses at a gallop and bicycles everywhere. And she wrote romantic novels. She, she had a couple of romances in her life. She was a very passionate woman. Um, she believed in spirits. Um, you know, she's often sort of breaking the mold. But even early on, when she was, um, she was in the, sort of the second generation of young women to go to university. She went to Oxford, and she got rather bored while she was at Oxford. In fact, when she was first first arrived, she was given this heavy book, which is a copy of the college rule book. And her first letter home to her mother says, you know, I don't know if I should stay long enough to break all the rules or be sent home straight away. Um, so that was her <laughs> attitude, you know. Um, and she ended up deciding she'd try and liven things up at the university by um, putting the bomb in a chapel one day. <laughs> Um, of course, she didn't do that. She was kind of joking, but it shows her, her sort of irreverent attitude. And she did other, you know, I think perhaps the thing she did that people considered most um, rebellious, really, was she fell in love with another woman at one point. But she also worked in a European war zone and, and she got arrested in Trafalgar Square, after which she insisted on conducting her own court case, which is a fabulous story. Um, and of course, she changed the world forever and for better. So, you know, there's so much in there to love. This book really is exactly like that. If you're going on a long flight, pick up the woman who saved the children because it'll seem like a short flight. And you'll you'll be <laughs> when you get there, you'll be a little bit sorry that you don't get to continue to the next bit of the story, especially when you're reading about a real woman, somebody who is standing back many times and observing herself and her life, not taking herself seriously or intensely seriously or not realizing that she's just a visitor here, as people like to say, on the planet Earth. You said independent organization, which makes me think 
Today, people may think that the UN handles all these things. Well, it's certainly not the case. And here's an organization where none of that exists. There's not even a League of Nations yet. And there's not much of a safety net in most nations. Some have none. Most, I would say, have none at the time. And the infant mortality rate, the mortality rate of children is so high that as you were talking about that, I thought they would recycle a name. For instance, Benedict Arnold here in, in the U.S. and then ends up going to London. His family had, I think, three children that they named Arnold until they had one that survived from childhood because they wanted to use the name. That's, That's I don't think anybody would think of doing that today. You might if you if you had a, a child, you wanted to name it after your your brother's child or something like that, they would do even into the Gilded Age. But it's almost like you didn't want to get too close to them because you knew that there was a chance they wouldn't make it out of childhood. I think people did get close to them, though. I think the suffering was just the same when they lost the child. But yes. Yeah, definitely. I'm just saying to wrap our minds around it. Here's somebody who comes in, Eglantine Jeb, and she says, well, part of the reason the mortality is high and you're suffering with those things is because we don't have the nutrition because we're not paying as close attention to them as we should because some of you are in the lower classes and there's this notion that that's their own lot, that they're responsible for their own lot and that things like charity would make them weak. Yes, that's something that she campaigned against very strongly. So, I mean, you're absolutely right. People have very different experiences as children in those days. I mean, Eglantine herself came from a fairly wealthy family, and she had a rather idyllic Edwardian childhood, one of six children who all survived, um, although her younger brother did die, um, unfortunately, very tragically. And I think that did affect her very much um, when he was at school. But before then, they had a very idyllic childhood. They used to steal the boys' lead soldiers and melt them down over the fire, turn them into bullets and go out hunting, all without their mum and dad's permission. So, I mean... (laughs) They were having quite a wild time of it. But, of course, most children in that period were were facing terrible circumstances. Um, We still had huge amounts of slums. The Liberal Children's Act in Britain came in in 1908, and that did some some good. But it was very basic things like protections at work. I mean, it didn't challenge the idea that children should work. It was just very basic protections for some of the most dangerous works. It brought in the idea that no child should be executed under the age of 16. So you can see how very basic it was. And meanwhile, children were still struggling to get an education. A lot of that child labor was still dangerous. Um, As you say, the main domestic charity worked on the idea that the poor were responsible for their own circumstances by their lack of morality. I mean, it's hard to imagine how they envisaged that that worked, as if you could improve the morality of people and somehow they get a better infrastructure, roads and sewers and more schools would pop up. You know, it's, it's bonkers. And of course, they weren't party to human rights, young people, until the until Eglantine came along. And that was just all in, in, in Britain. Because overseas at this time, we had massive victims of war. You know, um, Eglantine would say that every war is a war against the child, because whether or not you aim to put them in the front line, and of course, we did have child soldiers, and um, children suffered massively in the disease and the famine that followed war. Um, So all of that was what was motivating her. It reminds me of President Eisenhower, former Supreme Allied Commander Eisenhower's speech on the military-industrial complex. It's remembered for that, but he has that line in there that every bomber that's made, every gun that's sold, et cetera, et cetera, is in the final analysis, food that's stolen from the mouths of those who are hungry and all of these things. And When you look at the Great War, it's just so sad and it's just so pointless because we know as modern people, it's only setting the stage for a far worse conflict later. We know that the the pandemic is coming from the flu and all of this. And I'm sure at the time with so much people were doing that it would have been very easy for them to just take care of their own and certainly be just mad and resentful of the Germans and not care if their children died, if they all died. It would be very base, but you would feel that. Well, yeah, I mean, Eglantine got a lot of uh, animosity. As I said, she was sent hate mail and so on. Um, And in fact, she was, um, as I said, so ahead of her times in taking a much more humanitarian approach to all young people everywhere. And she was actually arrested by the British government, leaflets in Trafalgar Square, which is in the centre of London. It's a traditional site of public protest. On one account, actually has her chalking up the pavements with her messages as well, which was a typical suffragette tactic. And she had many friends who were suffragettes as well. So she would have known those circles. 
Uh, anyhow, she was arrested and taken away because the British government did meaning against their, uh, their policies post-war as they were trying to push through harsher peace terms with the defeated nations of Austria and Germany and so on. And Eggenstein insisted on conducting her own defence when it came to court. And she knew that technically she didn't have a leg to stand on. So she focused court reporters who were up in the gallery plenty to pad out their stories with. Or not pad them out, but, you know, to fill their columns with the good stuff she was saying. And the Crown Prosecutor, I think he's the only person in this story with a name to rival Eggenstein's marvellous name. He was called Sir Archibald Bodkin. <laughs> and uh, he didn't spare her in his condemnation. But when he had won a guilty verdict, um, the case was officially over, but everyone, including the reporters, was still there. He came up to her and he took out his wallet and he got out a five pound note. They were, they were huge sort of pieces of paper in those days. So he unfolded it very ostentatiously and pressed it into her hands. It was the sum of her fine, which was about the smallest fine she could have received anyhow. But Eggentine refused to accept it. She said, you know, thank you very much. I shall pay my own fine. Huh. But actually, I will take this five pounds and I will give it towards a new fund for the children, the starving children. I'll call it the Save the Children Fund. So she actually won her first ever donation to save the children from the Crown Prosecutor in her court case. <laughs> and then yeah. she and her sister, who you mentioned earlier, Dorothy Buxton, um, they were very close and supported each other throughout their lives. Um, they decided to see if they could build on the publicity, because it was all over the papers the next day, and hold a public meeting, see if they could do a bit of fundraising. And they were very ambitious sisters, so they booked the biggest venue they could find, which is the Royal Albert Hall in London. Still a massive, ostentatious venue where we hold the proms every year. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and they weren't expecting the crowd that turned up. I mean, there weren't enough seats in the Royal Albert Hall where they were for the crowd that arrived. But unfortunately around half of that crowd had actually turned up with rotten fruit and vegetables to throw at what these people considered to be the, the traitor sisters who wanted to give help to the enemy. So that was what Eggentine was facing. But um, I must say, she went in, she absolutely stunned them. And she started speaking quite nervously, I think, but her voice rose with her passion until she called out, surely it's impossible for us as normal human beings to watch children starve to death without making an effort to save them. And there was absolute silence in the hall. And people put away their rotten vegetables and pulled out their purses. And within 10 days, they'd raised £10,000, an extraordinary amount of money. Uh, and they donated it very quickly and, and put in place a sustainable source of aid. So they actually supported dairy cows in Vienna so that starving children would have ongoing supplies of nutrients. Very, very pioneering stuff. So, yes, I mean, she managed to defeat all the prejudice of her days and change people's hearts as well as their minds. And I said that looking back to history, we see that it just leads to the, to the flu pandemic is coming and they're going to have the Second World War. And it occurs to me that if there hadn't been this half measure that comes after the war and eventually people start feeling bad in the allied countries about the way they treated Germany and they say, well, let, let's let Hitler handle it. We, we, we don't want another war. And it was kind of unfair the way we treated him. But if they'd gone in there right after and had done for instance, what was done for Belgium and go in there, that was Herbert Hoover, and yeah, feed the point. starving people, maybe we wouldn't have had a Second World War I'd, because we would have, wouldn't have had this misery that occurs yeah. in, in the defeated nations. I've written a lot about the Second World War as well in different books, and often I come back to the work that Eggentine had done. And if she had managed to bring more people on side, I mean, what she was trying to do was to harness a universal concern, which is the well-being and welfare of the next generation, towards her, her dreams of a peaceful, harmonious future with, with peaceful international relations. She wanted all of those things. And she swept some people up with her, like uh, John Maynard Keynes, a very famous economist of Keynesian economics. Um, and he very much supported her work. And um, so a number of people were won over by it. And if only that argument had been better made, if only the terms of the Treaty of Versailles perhaps were different, attitudes were different, perhaps history itself would have been very different, yes. Eglantine Jeb gives us another great quote, and there's many of them here in The Woman Who Saved the Children. She says, the world is not ungenerous, but unimaginative and very busy. And there's that sense of her looking from above, from the yeah. outside at her life and at her society at the time. Having worked as a fundraiser today, I'm sure people feel we must be more busy than ever. What about that quote earned it such a prominent spot in The Woman Who Saved the Children? Because it's at the top of chapter one. 
Well, chapter one sort of introduced it. I mean, part of this book follows my own search into discovering Egg and Time, some of the remarkable stories and things I came across um, and the people that I met and interviewed. But, um, you know, I started off as a uh, fundraiser at Save the Children, and this quote just spoke very immediately to me. It's one of the first things that I heard about her. And I started using, I looked into her and was so inspired by her, I started using many more quotes from her when I went in to pitch for large amounts of sponsorship from companies and so on. And um, my fundraising actually got much better i was part grateful and part kind of irritated really because she had been dead for about 80 years and she was a better fundraiser than me still um so but, but you know she had this she was very much ahead of her times and she spoke very immediately and i think that that is true the world does feel very very busy it's not that people don't want to be generous but they're worried that uh, is it really going to have effect and do they have time and so on um, and i think i time really understood people's psychology very perceptively so um so yes i felt a real connection with her even though, you know, I also felt some irony as well, because I started writing this book when I went on maternity leave from Save the Children with my first daughter. And uh, I researched it while I had my three, I have three, three girls now, three daughters. And it always amused me that I was kind of, in a sense, hiding away from some of my early childcare responsibilities to do a bit of research. Um, and I completely adore my children, but there was an irony that here I was researching a woman who um, didn't actually like individual children very much and yet achieved so much for the lives of so many. And didn't have any children of her own. And you write no. in The Woman Who Saved the Children that she was strikingly beautiful and intelligent. And this is another mm -hmm. apparent contradiction, something that challenges people anyway, because People look at that as if, well, one must certainly flow to the other. You must certainly go get married. There's still pressure like that today. Hey, we want everyone to pair off as if we're a society of Noah's. And yet she didn't feel that pressure. I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction to be strikingly beautiful, intelligent and not to want to get married and have children. I, mean, I hope that most people don't see women as being defined only by marriage and motherhood. You know, she had a, an incredibly important vocation and, and role in the world. Um, but yes, of course, she she didn't want to get married for various reasons. But that didn't mean that she hadn't fallen in love. She she fell in love very passionately twice. Um, and I do cover these stories. And she wrote about the first of those um, uh, romances in a novel. She used to write these I suppose they were novels, social novels, designed to expose the ills of Edwardian society to her readers. But she was sensible enough to know that she had to coat any novel in a, you know, sugar it with romance. And, and so she wrote about this, her romance for her, uh, the man that she didn't marry, um, because he proposed to someone else very sadly. But she has her and her character out horse riding and feeling the, the strong legs of the horse pounding beneath her thighs. It's all very exciting. And actually, uh, a lady called Margaret Keynes, who was the younger sister of The Economist, they were deeply in love with each other. And I thought at first this was just a sort of spiritual romance or something like that, but not at all. I mean, their letters make clear that they, they shared cuddles and kisses and they were very supportive for each other in so many ways, intellectually as well, but they were deeply in love. And they actually wanted to get married. But of course, in those days, we were far from equality in that regard. So unfortunately, it wasn't possible. And in the end, Margaret decided that she really wanted to have children. And she married elsewhere. You know, she was on the edge of that Bloomsbury set with Virginia Woolf and people like that. You know what they say? They, they lived in squares and loved in triangles. It was all a little bit sort of outre. Eglantine was a little bit more uh, from a traditional family who probably didn't see things in that way. She just she just knew that she deeply loved this woman. But, of course, that would have made marriage impossible for her again. Well, this is what I'm trying to observe there when I say that about people expect this of you. Today, it, it will be different. Today, you can have your own career. Here at this point, for instance, just one part of your life, you can even have children without being married. But at this time, I'm saying people look at you and they say, as again, I think people still do today. When well, when are you going to get married? Why she? If if you're unattractive, they maybe they can understand. And for her, I think you have that pressure on you, as you said that you mentioned the suffragettes. There's, there's not even the ballot at this point. People are fighting for the ballot That's here right. here in the U.S. It's coming, and I think you're a little bit later there in the U.K. A few years later. So this is the thing. Like the societal pressures are very different on her. And I like that. I like that people look at that. And there has to be a little bit in a, in a lot of people that will read the woman who saved the children who start to think that. And then she confronts it. And I like that, that again and again, 
through the example of her life, she's challenging us to think differently, yeah. to act differently, and not to accept the conventional wisdom. You're absolutely right. I mean, right from the get-go, you know, when she's melting her brother's little toy soldiers down in the bullets, this is not what is expected of a little girl. You know, when she tears up her college rule book, even going to university was a little bit, you know, advanced in those days. But then to tear up the rule book, you know, that was outrageous. As a teacher in an underfunded school, I mean, a woman of her station in life and a woman isn't expected to become a teacher like that, especially not in a, in a school that was so poor. And she chose to work where there was most need. She's, again, defying convention. Um, as we talked about her marrying and her falling in love and her relationships. But of course, I mean, among many other things, she went off to, walk in a war, to work in a war zone. So in 1913, in the run-up to what became the First World War, it was a conflict. It was seen as a civil conflict in the Balkans area in Macedonia. And uh, Eglantine, this is a woman who uh, a few years earlier wasn't meant to cross a college quad on her own without an escort, um, now gets on a train on her own and goes into the middle of a war zone to distribute aid. And that's not it. You know, when she gets there, she does even more. She sets up soup kitchens in fields. She arranges um, families to be traced for children and all that sort of work. But she also undertakes to dodge away from her, her hosts, who are the, um, uh, the Serbs in the area who are winning the war in that zone, who are looking after her. But she manages to dodge away from them one evening and investigates reports of local mayors who have disappeared. And she scribbles down a name of missing people, missing men. And she knows that this is really dangerous document to have on her, and she's still got a couple of weeks out there. So she folds it up and sews it inside her clothes. And she actually wrote to her sister about feeling the names of murdered men pressing against her heart. But at the end of her work time there, she smuggles it out to her political contacts in Britain, and they investigate it. So, you know, she's constantly breaking convention. Nothing, what she's driven by is her own moral standards throughout her life. And if that means she has to break the law, She'll do it. Um, if it means that even though she's a woman, she conducts her own defense in court, she does it. And she wins people around all the way and she changes the world. You're enjoying my conversation with Claire Mully about her book, The Woman Who Saved the Children, a biography of Eglantine Jeb, founder of Save the Children. For more on our guest, you can visit her at ClaireMully.com, follow her at Claire Mully on Twitter. Or toss a like to facebook.com slash Claire Mully Author. And her last name is spelled C-L-A-R-E-M-U-L-L-E-Y. And remember, you can find our conversation about her book, The Women Who Flew for Hitler, in our archives. The Sunday Times of London writes that The Woman Who Saved the Children brings to life the world of clever and conscientious upper-middle-class women. Claire, let's flesh out that word unconventional. It's often applied to women of this era, the Victorian notions that we spoke about, the idea of the poor being responsible for their own lot, but also the nobility's obligation to the lower classes, which often came in conflict with this prevailing belief that they were responsible for what they suffered and that it was their own lack of moral fiber and that charity, they had to at least work a little bit if you were going to give them some charity or it would sap their self-reliance. So this is another place where she looks at the lines on the page and decides, well, I'm going to just shove my crayon right across. I'm going to draw right across it. But she does more than just say, well, I'm going to have a cotillion and donate some money, but keep those little wretches, as she actually calls them, away from me. So what can readers learn from the woman who saved the children about defying conventional wisdom and about not just accepting the writing of a check, but going out and doing something if you feel passionate about it? Well, I mean, there is so much in there. We've talked a lot about Eggentine being unconventional and making her own mind up on things, not just relying on what was the accepted values or the accepted norms of doing things. But that doesn't mean that she threw the rule book away either. She was very keen to learn from uh, people in society, great thinkers, heritage, history, tradition as well. So then she judged it and made her own mind up on things. So, for example, when she is first in Cambridge doing social work before she went overseas, just before the First World War, she wrote a 
first social audit of a city, which became very influential. And in it, she looked at new liberal ideas about citizenship and the idea of rights. And she starts talking about applying this in new ways. So it's building on those previous ideas. So the thing that she does is she applies the idea of citizenship to young people as well as to adults over 18. So when she talks about rights as well, she's very aware that people can't just be given a free pass to everything. She's all about people earning their own way. But that doesn't mean that everyone is in the same position to do so. And so it's about enabling people to fill their potential. It's about their rights, but it's also about human responsibilities. So when she wrote her, originally, it was just a five point statement on the rights of the child, the first four are rights, the sort of thing that you would imagine and recognize immediately, like the right to health care, the right to education, a safe environment to grow up in those sorts of very basic things. But the last right she had fifth point she mentioned is the right to be brought up in the awareness that you also should contribute to society so it's about rights and responsibilities being the flip part of the same coin so it's about making a, a very sensible judgment using your own uh, morality but taking into account everything else that's gone on as well it's 10 years since you wrote the woman who saved the children and I have the unique opportunity, therefore, to ask you what the reaction has been to the book. I'm sure many people, even who work at Save the Children, were like you and not so deeply familiar or not familiar at all, maybe, with her efforts and with her unique life. Not to mention people like myself who are familiar with Save the Children's mission, but its founder remained just a black and white photo to me, if that. So what's the reaction been from people and how do you feel about that as an author? Because her mission is still living and breathing. This is very different from most subjects you'd write about who are 100 years old. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I found it incredibly humbling, really. And when the book first came out 10 years ago, it was the first book I wrote, and uh, it won a national prize, the Daily Mail Prize for Biography. So I was astounded by that. That was great. And I think, I must say, credit goes to Eglantine rather than me. But uh, between, between us, it did well. And then I started getting letters from, say, the children supporters, you know, pensioners to school children. I've given them loads of school talks, helped to inspire young people with her story. And, and it's amazing how much it, it is so relevant today. It really speaks very directly to people, young and old. And then new people have started supporting the fund, inspired by Eglantine as well. We've had a one-woman show by a woman called Anne Chamberlain about Eglantine's life. And uh, this year, actually, to mark the centenary of Save the Children, we had another one-night-only show about Eglantine and the court case, uh, written by another woman, Charlotte McLeod. Um, and in it, Eglantine was played by Jolie Richardson, and Helena Bonham Carter played the judge in the trial. It was absolutely fantastic. And this, of course, really helps to, to bring that story out. Um, Jolie Richardson's now written, going to narrate the book on audio. That should come out later this year. Um, we've had a bronze bust cast of Eglantine Jeb that was unveiled at the Royal Albert Hall, where the fund was launched 100 years ago. I should say that none of this was paid for by the charity, of course, it's all been sponsored privately. There's talk of an Eglantine lecture, an annual lecture in her name uh, at Oxford University here now to take the values that she really cared about, her humanitarianism, her pioneering creative way of thinking, uh, onto new generations through Oxford University. So the, the response has been amazing. And of course, the wonderful thing is that royalties are donated directly to the charity. So every, every book doesn't just tell the story, it also helps directly to support the work that she um, she set up. You include the 1923 Declaration of Rights of the Child in The Woman Who Saved the Children. And I wonder if, as I was saying earlier about the UN and national organizations and a big social safety net, people think that the work is done and they wonder just how much more work is to be done. Or maybe it's, it surprises us to some level. Mm -hmm. And you probably encountered this when you went and fundraised and people think, well, I pay my taxes. That, sh that should go to that. There's foreign aid, maybe something where we are so busy that we don't think we need to do much more. So having written this biography of her, just how much of Eglantine Jeb's work remains to be done by her organization that it's still thriving? Well, I, I think sadly we all know that there is unfortunately still many, many children in very deep need and risk to their lives from both disease and natural disaster, but also from man-made things as well. So I think it is really important that Save the Children continues its work. It's not the UN. I have 
great respect for the UN, which actually does now, of course, support Eglantine's Statement of Children's Rights, which has since evolved directly into the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child that you mentioned. Independent organisations as well who have no government um, direction in them, so they are free to make their own decisions on things. I think that's very vitally important. Um, Eglantine herself did believe, you know, it was possible to eventually, you know, move to a, a perfect point. She said, clearly there is no inherent impossibility in saving the children of the world. It is only impossible if we make it so by our refusal to attempt it. So I think, you know, there's a long way to go. But if we, you know, if only we could all get behind this, if only we could have that belief and put that energy in, I think we could make huge achievements. Um, and the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child has now been signed by every country in the world, except for one, which I'm afraid is the United States of America. Having said that, even many of those countries who have signed it doesn't mean that they're achieving everything that we would wish through that convention. I think the UN Convention is like a, it's a lighthouse, it's a beacon to guide us, and it's also an international standard, very useful to assess countries' progress and, and uh, help them make tracks. But it takes everyone to implement it. So there, there is some way to go, but Eglintine's work really helps to direct us in that. One quick question, and that's that you dedicate your book in part to Millicent Eglantine. <laughs> yes. Who is she? Oh, well, you see, I think I mentioned when I started researching this book, I was on maternity leave. I was pregnant with my first daughter. Um, and it actually took me seven years to research and write this book. I had three children and doing an MA because I wanted to do a good book, properly researched. And uh, actually... When I was finishing the book, it was a race between which I was going to deliver first, the book or my third daughter. Um, and, and the book is dedicated to all three of my daughters. Um, I think I, I call them symbols of universal potential and very lively little girls in the here and now. Um, but now, of course, they're, they're a little bit older than that. And Millicent Eglantine, she is my eldest girl, but they are all named in the dedication. I'm a very lucky woman. So there you go. I mentioned earlier, without even thinking of it, the idea of a legacy living on in a name where somebody else is inspired yeah. by you and decides to have a name. So there you go. She she has a very proud name. And then read this book and say, what a woman. I mean, what a, what an example. What a person. I mean, anybody, as you were talking before you mentioned about the casting in bronze and before you mentioned the pound notes and the coin, I thought, well, this is a person. We're always talking about adding some women's statues in Central Park, they're talking about tearing down the statues of men and putting up women's statues. Central Park's pretty big. I think we can just add some figures. And this woman seems like she should have a statue up. I would put one right there in Trafalgar Square. And uh, <laughs> what, what more fitting tribute? I would She's an amazing person, an amazing name to carry. Exactly. I would love there to be a another statue. I mean, I'm delighted now. We've, we've had the um, bronze that was unveiled at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, it's There's a bronze at the Oxford College that Eglantine went to now where that lecture, I hope, will be started next year, the annual lecture. Um, and there's a copy of it at Save the Children's Head Office as well. But I would love to get another one in Trafalgar Square or some public space because she is really inspirational. And I think then everyone would sort of find out who is this woman and what's her story. I have one final question for you. And that's a quote again from Eglantine, whose voice still speaks to us. Certainly the woman who saved the children is bringing her to life, even from the grave. She's still speaking. She's still so full of life. So this quote stuck with me, and I wanted to close with it. We want men and women everywhere to take up their stand in the common, simple things of everyday life, which should unite us all. Claire, aside from making a donation or buying a copy of The Woman Who Saved the Children, which in turn makes a donation to Save the Children, what can readers do to look at those common, simple things the way Eglantine Jeb and Dorothy Buxton did a century ago so that we don't just accept our world as it is, but we try to change it for the better and achieve that dream that Eglantine Jeb had of a more perfect world? Well, gosh, it's a huge question. Um, Eglantine was a, a deep humanitarian. For her, I think the child was a, a, the symbol of all people. She said, for example, the only international language in the world is a child's cry. And I think what she was doing was she was looking at the commonality, what we, what all people have, what we share. She saw what we had in common, where unfortunately many people differences between us. We had a politician in this country called Jo Cox, and she said as well, we have far more in common with each other than that which divides us. I, I think what we should be doing is looking out for each other, looking, I mean, obviously respecting difference, uh, that, that great richness that we all can all bring to each other from different culture and so on. But we should also look at what we have in common. We need to oppose racism, sexism, discrimination of all kinds. Um, 
I suppose without being preachy, for me, it's about donating some money, yes, and some time as I can fit in around my life. But it's also lived by these principles of, you know, not letting prejudice pass when we meet it, but getting involved, getting stuck in whenever there's opportunity. Well, Claire Mully, author of The Woman Who Saved the Children, thank you so much for taking the time not just to come and talk with me today about Eglantine Jeb on the centennial of Save the Children, but for introducing me to her. I'm a richer person as you're quoting her. And as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to carry that with me, carry quotes like that about the cry of a child being the only international language. This is that kind of book where you will read it and you will be a better person. You'll be thoughtful and you'll carry it with you always. You'll you'll have a little Eglantine Jeb there sitting on your shoulder, whispering to you, who acting as your, your better angel. I think we could all use an extra one of those in our lives. Absolutely. I wish you the best of luck with the book. Continued success with it. I highly recommend it to anybody looking for an enjoyable, inspiring read. It just brings everything, and it's a real life story that is about improving our world. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to hear that. Thank you. Again, the book is The Woman Who Saved the Children, a biography of Eglantine Jeb, founder of Save the Children. As always, You can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. But no matter where you purchase today's book, remember you're helping to support Save the Children and their charitable work around the world. My sincere thanks to Claire Mully for joining us and for introducing us to someone who at first glance seems an unlikely champion of those too young to champion themselves. Remember to check out our previous conversation with Claire That was about her book, The Women Who Flew for Hitler, a true story of soaring ambition and searing rivalry. That's in our archives at historyauthor.com, on our iHeartRadio channel, iTunes, or wherever you're listening now. For more on our guest, visit clairemully.com, follow at clairemully on Twitter, or toss a like to facebook.com slash clairemullyauthor. And while you're at it, Let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean, Instagram at The History Author Show, or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of The History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together... Thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears 